Um, now, just to handle this, uh, yourself at this stage, and you're looking, I suppose, to always look for new members, and how's the, how's the environment to, to bring new members in the Angel Network? Um, for us, I think the environment has been very good. We've grown from 65 members to 90 members over the last uh, three, four years. Um, I think that there's a lot more enthusiasm in terms of what's happening in the tech space, and I think what we're seeing is in the recent IPOs, not that our companies are going to go IPO, but just the enthusiasm that it generates uh, has been positive for uh, angel groups. Yeah, I mean, one of the developments that's happening in the accelerator space, of course, is that there's actually a lot of younger entrepreneurs that are exiting, and almost all of them immediately become angel investors. Um, but that can actually be really helpful, even though they don't have the angel investing experience, they really understand the newer technologies and can get a grasp of why a social mobile kind of application is going to be effective, where um, someone who made all their money in real estate or pharma not, might not be able to do that. Um, and so in some of the regions where there have been a lot of successful exits of early stage companies, there's a whole new class of angel investor that's coming to the table that I think is you know, adding an interesting element because they really get some of the innovative technologies that are coming out. Uh, Boston Harbor Angels is growing um, just as Launchpad, but much slower. And I think maybe because we had reached that size earlier and now we slowed down. And it's, you know, I'm, maybe we're being, I don't know that we're being more selective, but we in fact have new potential members and guests at every meeting, so that's, that's a good sign. The real question is whether those cats are going to start to bring out their checkbooks, you know. And, you know, if you are the president of Boston Harbor Angels, and we do have one, and the managing director, all you hear about, well, just take 2011. We had, you know, a $500 million sale to Merck, and that was just a down payment because we got 15% product royalties, you know, going on into the future. We had one IPO, Carbonite. People hear about Carbonite. So we hype. So, so clearly, we won't have problems, and in in, in, I think, in terms of attracting new members, but it, it always how can we shorten the process, you know, of writing the checks? Um, and as an entrepreneur, I'm as impatient with the process as Kevin Rankin is. He's out there, so. <laughs> well, the, the bottom line for angel groups, uh, as quoted by the ACA, the American uh, Group of Angels, is that the average uh, uh, angel group has a 30% attrition, 30% members need to be replaced. At Maple Leaf, we found that that was not untypical, um, and um, uh, maybe for various reasons. So th this is a fact of life. Uh, and um, uh, obviously, um, groups learn how to uh, manage their investment, become wiser. And uh, certainly at the NACO, we're, we are talking about uh, really getting uh, uh, um, uh, a uh, discipline on and, and putting and focusing an effort on ROIs, return on investments, and, and sharing the different styles and the different results. I think that's one of the, for, for Ottawa, one of the big things is actually just people talking about it. So, you know, like the band of scandals, we do have a, a positive return on investment. We don't ever go out to the press. We don't ever tell anybody that. Um, it's a matter of actually getting out there and saying that, you know what, angel investing is positive. It is doing something positive for the community. It is doing positive and something positive in terms of the angels' return. So in Ottawa, we, we have had a hard time in terms of the last few years. A lot of angels got crammed down. They just walked away. There was angels angels in fighting, <laughs> cat fighting, I guess, too, <laughs> if you want to call it that. There was some of that, too, because in, you know, when, the, when in the midst of down rounds, when you're arguing over the little scraps that are there, left behind, so there's some of that. But we've also had some positive exits, and we've had some positive, we have angels in town that are new angels that we haven't tapped into, and that's one of the things that we're going to try and do is actually get out there and start engaging some of the new angels, getting, being more public about the, the things that have been positive in Ottawa, the returns that have been positive, the companies that have been positive, um, the opportunities, and you know, to get along with, uh, you know, when you bring in new angels, when I started, uh, you know, I did it on my own to begin with, which was fine, you know, because it's your own money and you kind of, I'm sure I didn't do half of the things that I should have done, but anyways, uh, it worked out well. Um, when you get into a group, you start learning different processes, even just the terminology. I had a very experienced CFO who went to one of our angel meetings going, uh, 
you know, I should know all this, but uh, it's Greek to me. So one of the things is actually educating, ed educating the angels and having education groups and letting uh, new angels get, understand what's, how, what angels investing is all about, what some of the terms mean, what uh, those, the term sheets, et cetera, et cetera. And to, to really take advantage of the experience of some of the older angels. So that's one way I think we can try and engage some of the new angels in, in town. Yes, Phil. One of the things I've seen, and, and this in a sense affects the new members seem to, we're getting more entrepreneurs bringing in convertible debenture deals, you might call them here, where they're failing to price the round. And there's tremendous resistance in my group, and I think in Launchpad you don't do them. And I've spent quite a bit of time converting, but the new angels get a little frustrated with that a little bit. Like, why can't we just do that? You know, we'll have an 8% dividend. Yeah, but they're not going to pay it. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's out there in the future. It's, you know, you can call it debt, but it's really equity. I mean, you're out there with as much risk as any angel investor. So um, sometimes the newer angels take time to be educated into a more systematic process. That doesn't mean I don't do a convertible debt deal, but I do it with kicking and screaming. Yeah, but I think to, the, to you know, your point that they also have something to teach us because, you know, we're still old school thinking telecom and auto, all yeah. that sort of thing. And some of these new companies are just, you know, you put up a website, you get the social networking, it goes viral, it does this, and we're Seven kind of going, evaluation. what? <laughs> so there's something in terms of some of the new angels teaching some of the old angels new tricks, new things that are going on. So that's as, as important as the other way, too. Uh, do you find the new school more aggressive about the way they do, uh, they don't the want to. Their... They don't want to wait two, three months to do a deal, or six months to do a deal. They want to get a deal done in a couple of weeks, and they don't understand why it should take longer. I find that. I would, yeah, I would say with a lot of the younger angels, there's less due diligence and a lot of gut. Um, but it's usually because they have a lot of money to throw around and they haven't been burned yet, and so they haven't sort of learned the wisdom of how <laughs> angel investing can also not work out if you don't pay attention. So I think they find the due diligence process and stuff. Um, extraneous and it's not necessarily. There's a reason that it happens and why it's part of the process. So, One of the reasons I like being part of an angel group is there's lots of people with gray hair and I may think I understand something and when it gets into a due diligence discussion I get multiple opinions and from people who have deep scars on their back from mistakes they've made. So at least for I think everyone in the angel group that's why we're there, is we get the benefit of some very sophisticated viewpoints, and then we can evaluate it from that point. Interesting. Is there any question from the floor? Is there any question? We may. We should. Uh, I would like to, uh, to ask you to elaborate a little bit more on the relationship between the accelerator, the uh, VC fund, which may be linked to your accelerator, and the angels, because obviously the accelerator is a plus for the angels and the funds because, because it feeds the pipeline, but uh, it, it also costs something to run an accelerator. So uh, do these people invest in the accelerator at the, at, at the start, or do they pay something at the accelerator when they invest in a company which comes out of the accelerator? So how does the ecosystem work? Yeah, so I can't, I can't speak for all the accelerators. There are actually some models that are quite different. So for example, Y Combinator in the Valley is, you know, has a relationship specifically with Sequoia Capital, whereas we actually don't have a single uh, venture firm that is connected with us. So we do have limited partners who invest in the accelerator. They get an equity stake in the companies that come in, um, but there's no, not necessarily any follow-on relationship. In fact, some of our in LPs are state economic development resources, so it's about building jobs in Pennsylvania, for example. Um, our New York fund is funded by angels, and they're really doing it as a, as a way to get access to deal flow, but there's no specific relationship afterwards. So we have relationships with a whole series of early stage angels, or sorry, early stage funds and angels who we invite in if we think that they're actually qualified investors who are going to understand the space that our companies are in, um, and there's no financial obligation to, to, to compensate us. We're getting compensated essentially from the equity stake that we take in the companies, and the return we'll get on that down the road. Um, now, what we are doing is starting to build funds where we can actually do follow-on rounds in our companies, and so there is an opportunity for investors to actually become part of our LP network and actually have that early um, equity stake and follow-on rights in our companies. 
Um, we also do some relationships where there's actually more of a sponsorship. So for example, Comcast Ventures um, is looking into building minority um, entrepreneurs. And so we have a program where they help sponsor the costs of the accelerator and the stipends that we give the companies. And they share the equity in that because they want to make sure that we invest specifically out of every cycle, five out of the 15 companies will be minority entrepreneurs. And so there's a relationship there. So I think there's a lot of different models. Um, but there's also the flexibility to just be an angel group that wants to be friendly to dream and we invite in and let them meet our entrepreneurs because we want our entrepreneurs to have a path to funding. Um, and so there's no necess you don't have to be tied in financially with us in order to get access to our companies. When a group of angels, for instance, invest in the accelerator, do they, do they get a right of first Something. Yes, yes. So for example, right now in the companies that we bring into the program, we get 6% and our fund gets 6% and the right to invest up to 25% in the follow-on round and that's distributed pro rata to the LPs in our fund. Is there any other question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, so you just recently discussed the issue of convertible debentures, mostly from a negative point of view. The real issue there, of course, is postponing the valuation, kicking the can down the road, as George would say. Um, and uh, what happens when you make the decision that, uh, no, we're not going to do a convertible to venture, we're going to bite the bullet, and by golly, we're going to do the valuation ourselves. And then a year or two later, along comes ABC, and for whatever reason, their valuation is, um, is one that makes you think like you left some money on the table. Um, how do you confront your fellow, first of all, do you have a mechanism built into the documents that gives you what the VCs get? If you do, did VCs try to uh, negate that because you opted for a lower valuation? And if so, how do you deal with your other angels who aren't happy when that happens? Well, my answer is easy. I haven't encountered that. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, our experience is that uh, the valuation is relevant at a point in time. And at the time you made the deal, that's the valuation. And six or nine or 12 or 18 months later, it's going to be different and it's going to be up or it's going to be down. And that's just uh, the way it works. If the company hit the milestones and they did what they were supposed to do and the overall economy is hot and that space is good, fine, it's up. But I can't predict what's going to happen in the future. I can only say today, this is what it's worth. And um, I'm fairly comfortable having that discussion. And if we can't agree, I'm not sure that's an entrepreneur that we want to uh, be in bed with. Another way to look at it is that, uh, again, it's time, timing of each valuation. It turns out I paid a lot of money for life insurance last year to make people other than me real happy. OK, I paid $8,000 8, or something for my old key man policies which have converted. I didn't die. Was that a waste of money? <laughs> it's contingency. <laughs> yes, sir. So uh, David from Inovia Capital. So I got first a comment, then a question. Sure. First, the comment, I think, uh, you know, anybody raising an angel round to not open it up to include somebody south of us or across the border and extend those contacts, I think is, is almost foolish. I think there's tremendous value add that can be I brought agree. and extending above and beyond the angel community in Osh Quebec, for example, may not have some of the contacts that being in the US for a later round with US VCs, US contacts, and so on. I mean, it's a very different ecosystem. You're gonna get a deck and a term sheet from me tonight. No, but it's, it's, uh, no I find it, you know, thanks for coming here and sharing and being so open and wanting to work. It's, it's tremendous, the ecosystem has evolved so much. But the other question is, and probably for the US, uh, US angels that are here, generally speaking, what's the, uh, what's the ROI uh, in the US for, uh, for angels? It's, I, I don't have the general statistics. Um, it's, 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 it's obviously bimodal. If you look at Carbonite and Merck, we're, you know, whoopee, you know, thing, thing. Um, and then you look at the others and there's no great progress in the other 80 or something companies we invested in. You know, I mean, there's no valuations or whatever. So maybe I can shed some light on that. The official uh, figure published by the ACA, the American Capital Association, is 27% return. However, uh, when you query uh, Marion Hudson, for example, and say, well, who are the uh, uh, people who answered the, 
uh, uh, the report or the questionnaire, <laughs> nine companies, okay? So um, otherwise you gotta ask individually angel groups what their experience has been. David, it's also for everyone out there, the angel investing like venture investing, it's a bimodal set of barbells. You either have a big home run of one or two companies or you have a bunch of losses or very, very modest where you're lucky to get your money back. And it's either one or the other. So depending on whether you're able to hit a home run, and um, there's a company called Smart Cells that um, one of the angel groups I'm involved in invested in, and if everything works out, it's a 50 to one return. That makes up for every stupid investment we've made, and the portfolio's got 14 companies, and there's nothing close to smart cells. But every other bad investment that we've made um, is going to be offset by that 50 to one uh, return. So when you say, what's, uh, how do we do, and how did any individual angel group do, boy, it's really specific and how lucky you got. Right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much to this great panel. I've, I've certainly learned a lot from them today and found it very insightful. So thank you for this afternoon.